Hello everyone and welcome to Parsi's IAS. Let's take up today's news analysis that is 27th November 2019. Our first article of the day is with respect to Maharashtra elections. In middle of lot of political dramas which is happening in Maharashtra, last day, Governor of Maharashtra, Bhagat Singh Kushari have invited Shiv Sena Chief Uddhav Thakare to form the next government in Maharashtra. The new coalition which is formed in Maharashtra is named as Maharashtra Vikas Akhadi. The swearing in ceremony will take place on November 28. An MBA that is Maharashtra Vikas Akhadi, the new coalition which is formed, have to submit the list of MLA supporting new government to the governor before December 3rd. The day's development were set in motion soon after there was a hearing from Supreme Court asking that Mr. Koshyari to ensure a floor test and conducted on November 27 to determine whether Chief Minister Devendra Fatnavis commands majority in the assembly. He have noted proved his majority in the assembly. While talking about the procedure of the floor test, the bench led by Justice N. V. Ramana have ordered that immediate appointment of a pro tem speaker. Now let us understand what is the designation of pro tem speaker stand for. This is a temporary position. Operative person on the chair of the speaker of Lok Sabha on state legislative assemblies temporarily holding the post is called pro tem speaker. So what happens is that when a new party is elected to the legislative assembly or to the center, the existing party will not be there active and their speaker will be there in the chair till the new elected. Till the new elected party appoints a pro term speaker. So pro term speaker is only a temporary position that is there to facilitate. So he is elected to handle the activities of the house. Powers regarding pro term speakers are not clarified. But this is very clear that pro term speaker does not have as much as power as a permanent speaker. He cannot or at least does not exercise the serious powers of the speaker like defection etc. But in regular routine work he enjoys the same position power and privilege and immunities as that of a regular speaker. So the, his appointment is subject to conditions like this. He has to work for a limited period till the new speaker and deputy speakers are elected after the elections. When newly elected house is yet to elect its speaker, his designation is important. So to run activities of the house till the speaker is elected, the house chooses one of them with agreement to work as a pro tem speaker. Normally, eldest members who are elected will be selected. Even of the other situations when the post of speaker and deputy speaker lie vacant due to death or resignation, again pro tem speaker will be appointed to the house. Interestingly, after few hours of this judgment by the Supreme Court, the existing Prime Chief Minister, that is, Mr. Fatnavis announced his resignation saying that BJP no longer had the majority after his deputy Ajit Pawar of the NCP resigned citing personal reasons. Another important fact to be noted in this news is that the judgment by the Supreme Court. Three judge went to Supreme Court led by Justice N. V. Ramana while calling for an immediate floor test in Maharashtra on Tuesday referred to the nine judge bench judgment of in the case of SR Bombay versus Union of India in the year 1994. So he said that it is a legislative assembly that represents the will of the people and not the governor. With regards to this development, we have another news which is quoted with the same article. The article talks about opposition's performance in the constitution day. So November 26 is celebrated as the constitutional day. But opposition parties boycotted the joint parliamentary sitting which was commemorated to constitutional day on Tuesday. Instead, they all congregated at the statue of B.R. Ambedkar in the parliament gardens to protest against attempts by the BJP to form the government in Maharashtra by poaching NCP MLAs. Every year, November 26th, we celebrate as constitutional day because on this day in 1949, B.R. Ambedkar presented the draft constitution to people of India. Our next article is regarding education and women empowerment, especially in rural India. This is regarding a new scheme which was introduced in Telangana and the operation is called Operation Blackboard. So article says for these moms, Operation Blackboard comes home. In Telangana, 41,000 women learn the Telugu alphabet from their own children and clear the exam. This is in news because 41,000 women in Telangana Sangareddy district can now feel the power of the written word and after learning alphabets for the first time. Interesting thing is that they have schooled from their own children. 
women have cleared examination conducted by NIOS that is National Institute of Open Schooling. Normally the general trend is that in a year around 4000 to 5000 new or the neo literates from each district annually will uh, submit the exam. But thanks to Sangaridi program where female literacy initiated by then district collector Manik Kiraj Karnan in 2017. In India we have a scheme called Saksha Bharat Mission which is to increase the literacy among the adults. Okay, This imparts functional literacy and numeracy but faces a shortage of coordinators across the states. So what happened is that in the year 2017, the district administration have designed a project called Ammekki Akshara Mala that means alphabets for the mother or alphabet garland for the mother and this robbed in students in class 7 to class 10. What happened is that they were asked to teach their mothers to read and write Telugu alphabet at home. So most women were part of self help groups and all but they are not, illit not literate. So administration identified 52,000 women were eligible to take the exam and send the list to central government because they were supposed to take exam through NIOS that is National Institute of Open Schooling. The women got books developed by district administration and they drafted volunteers also from the Indra Kranti Pratham, a rural poverty alleviation scheme to give worksheets to self help group members. So out of 52,000 eligible 48,000 took exam and 41,000 passed the exam. In a 15 day literacy module women were taught four letters of Telugu alphabets in a day. Our next article is with respect to biodiversity and its conservation. The news is there when 8,000 migratory birds flock to Andhra Pradesh, Kolleru Lake has become a safe breeding ground for two birds that is grey pelicans and painted stalks. And the place or the sanctuary is called Attapaka Bird Sanctuary. It is on the West Godavari Krishna district border in the Kolleru Lake that has become a fast and a safe breeding ground for two migratory bird species and two bird species are grey pelicans and painted stalks. So what happened is that not less than 6000 grey pelicans and 1200 painters that is minimum number have made the Atapaka sanctuary their winter home for breeding. The sanctuary surrounded by an artificial pond has a good vegetation cover supporting nest for the avian guest. Atapaka village is the only location on the lake where bird lovers can have a glimpse of the painted stalk of very close that is all less than 100 meters and it's the prime spot for photographers. But there is a challenge with respect to this site. Present water level in Kolleru Lake including the Atapaka sanctuary is posing a slight challenge for the birds to hunt their prey in the deep waters because there is change in the water level in the lake. However, the water level is expected to start receding soon. So what now water level is high that it is very difficult to get the prey for these birds. So if water level reduces to little bit down, it is easy for the birds to have an arranged breeding site. You can see from the picture here, pelicans picture is shown in the here. So these are white pelicans which are which have come to Kolleru Lake precisely in Atapaka bird sanctuary for the breeding and the nesting processes. This is a political map of India. In this respective map, we can locate Atapaka wildlife sanctuary or Kolleru Lake in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Okay, here. Here we have Atapaka Wildlife Sanctuary. Let's take up our next article of discussion. This is regarding science and technology in India. Okay. Sharp eyed Kartosa tree to take to the skies today. PSLV C47 will carry the Earth observation satellite and 13 small ones. Most advanced satellite developed in India by ISRO chief. Let us understand why this is in news. This is news because advanced earth observation satellite Kartosat 3 which is due to the launch from the Satish Dhawan Space Center at Sri Harikota at coastal Andhra Pradesh on Wednesday morning will have the sharpest eye of the civil remote sensing satellites in the world. So what do you mean by civil remote sensing satellite that means used for the civil purposes like 
large scale urban planning rural resources infrastructure development coastal land use and land cover as we discussed it will be carried out by PSLV C47 13 small satellites including two US customers will be the secondary payloads one of our important speciality with respect to this Cartosat 3 launch is that the cameras offers a ground resolution of 25 cm this means it can pick up an object of minimum of that size of a height of around 500 kilometers so before we had only a range of 65 centimeters now we have five the previous view was from Cartosat was 65 centimeters the satellite will be able to see objects that are just 25 centimeters from its orbital perch around 500 kilometers away that is the main differentiation with respect to this launch currently this record is with a US company Maxa which have the best resolution of 31 centimeters so once India launches will, will this India will be the number one with 25 centimeters camera definition so history in Cartosat launch is that ISRO that is Indian Space Research Organization till now that is from the year 2005 to 2019 have sent eight Cartosats okay and the data from most of them especially by the last four Carto 2 series ones is launched in relatively quick succession in the past three years and exclusively used by army forces for the defense purpose. An important differentiation of this Cartosat launch is that it is the heaviest that is 1625 kilograms. Cartosat 3 is unusually heavy and more than double the mass of the previous 8th in this class. So many new technologies have been built in such as highly agile or flexible camera, high speed data transmission, advanced computer system, new power electronics. Last day chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO K. Shivan has termed Cartosat 3 is the most complex and advanced satellite India have ever developed. So what is the main use of launching a vehicle like this? Okay. It is mainly an earth observation satellite which can provide spatial, spectral and temporal data for various fields including urban planning, agriculture, water resources management, environment and disaster management more towards a civilian perspective. Let's take up our next article of discussion. This is regarding NRC or National Registry of Citizens. The article is actually a critic towards the announcement of government last week that there will be a national register of citizens will be done and a process what was conducted in Assam. The same like that a process will be conducted across India to identify the pure citizens. Okay. The article says that misadventure of a new citizenship regime. A rationale for a nationwide register of citizens is feasibility above all its moral legitimacy are questionable. First, let us understand why this is in news. This is in news because Parliament recently yet another exercise is counting was proposed for a nationwide national register of citizens. So, NRC will be implemented across India was a decision taken by Parliament last week. While its predecessors were counting residents rather than citizens, the objective of this latest initiative is to count citizens, especially to sift and sort citizens from non-citizens to include and exclude and having done so to weed out infiltrators. This will be destined for detention camps and potential deportation. In this discussion or the article, the author have tried to question this act that is rationally of a nationwide NRC its feasibility and above all its moral legitimacy are questionable. So there is also an act is quoted here that is Foreigners Act of 1946. So the article says according to this act burden of proof rests on the individual charged with being a foreigner. Okay. So if a person is charged an acquisition that he has to prove himself that he is citizen or is charged with the acquisition that being a foreigner then the burden is only with him to prove that he is citizen but with the introduction of the citizenship act no independent mechanism for identifying aliens will be there what will happen is that nrc effectively places an entire population under suspicion of alienage that is with that justification can a state that does not have the ability to detect aliens or even to secure its borders against illegal migrants set out to find aliens by elimination is the question asked 
Next, the article criticized about resources that India have to use if India is conducting the National Register of Citizens audit and the thereby elimination process. The article says that let us also understand the resources needed to conduct an NRC before discussing the deep moral misgivings such as project must revoke. Okay, so for example, we can consider the case of Assam. Assam, we have spent around sixteen hundred crore rupees and fifty thousand officials worked. to audit a population of 3.3 crores and we know that 90 lakh people stand apart saying that they have to prove their citizenship or they have to prove that they are not foreigners likewise if we are planning to do for the entire india means our electorate have 87.9 crore people so approximately in this example we have to sum up an amount of 4.26 lakh crore rupees to conduct a nation wide exercise There is a close relationship between NRC, that is National Register of Citizens, with the new amended Bill of Citizenship Amendment Bill. So, if the NRC casts out paths to statelessness for groups that are disfavored, Citizenship Amendment Bill will create paths to citizenship for preferred groups. This will there will be a preferred groups, which will be summed up after this exercise. Therefore, the implicit assumption in the NRC is that infiltrators are Bangladeshis. Okay, who must be de-enfranchised and stripped of any markers of citizenship that may have illegitimately acquired. And more interesting fact is that the explicit promise of citizenship in the Citizenship Amendment Act or CAB will include all other religions except Muslims. And we know that Bangladesh is almost a Muslim majority country, so there is no meaning for the bill passed and for the exercises done. The Citizenship Amendment Bill also paved a path for eligible fast track citizenship gainers in India because if they are prosecuted minorities in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, or Pakistan, they will get citizenship in India. The bill does not specify what, if any, evidence would be required for validating the claims of religious persecution, nor does it offer similar respite to the victims of sectarian religious persecutions in neighboring countries like Rohingyas from Myanmar. we can summarize this discussion by saying that constitutionally india is a political community whose citizens avow the idea of nation as a civic entity transcending ethnic differences so this nrc cab that is national register citizens and Con citizenship amendment bill com combination signals a transformative shift from a civic national conception to a ethno national conception of india as a political community in which identity determines gradations of citizenship Let's go ahead with our next article of discussion. This is almost like a legislation which is coming. That is, government plans to merge Daman and Dew and Dadra and Nagar Haveli. They are planning to merge this duplication and wasteful expenditure cited as reasons. Okay. So, Union Home Minister of State, J. Kishan Reddy, introduced a bill in Lok Sabha on Tuesday to merge UTs of Daman and Dew and Dadra and Nagar Haveli. So, Dadra and Nagar Haveli and Daman and Dew. Merger of Union Territories Bill has been introduced. The bill states that for the better delivery of services to the citizens of both UTs by improving efficiency and reducing the paperwork, having two separate constitutional and administrative entities in both the UTs, there is a lot of duplication, inefficiency, and wasteful expenditure. So, in view of the policy of the government to have a minimum government, maximum governance, considering the small population and limited geographical area of both the UTs. to use the services of officers efficiently it has been good that if we merge the uts in the political map of india we can locate these two union territories in the state of gujarat towards the southern part of gujarat almost sharing the border of maharashtra we can in the coastal area we can mark dadra and nagar haveli at the same time towards the western part of the indian uh, country country of india and the southern part of gujarat we can mark daman and dew so the bill is proposed now to merge this two and keep in same administrative force let's go ahead with our next article of discussion this is regarding indian economy where rbi flags rising bad assets from mudra loans unsustainable credit growth in sector would raise risk in the system So let us first understand why this is in news. This is in news because RBI have expressed last day concerns over rising bad loans. Okay, there is rising bad loans from Mudra loan scheme. 
द योजना इज कॉल्ड प्रधानमंत्री मुद्रा योजना पी एम वाई प्रधानमंत्री मुद्रा योजना अ स्कीम अनाउंस्ड बाय प्राइम मिनिस्टर इन द ईयर 2015 व्हिच ऑफर्स फास्टर क्रेडिट विद टिकट साइजेस स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम 50000 टिल 10 लाख टू स्मॉलर बिजनेसेस सो फर्स्ट वी विल गो अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट इज दिस मुद्रा लोन स्कीम टॉक्स अबाउट दिस इज द मुद्रा लोन स्कीम सो मुद्रा ऑफरिंग्स आर Technology enablers, refinance for micro units to commercial banks, NBFCs, RRBs, SFBs, and MFIs, credit guarantee for mudra loans, development and promotional support. Loans will be also given to sectoral development, financial literacy, institutional development. So, basically, given to technology enabled, refinancing is done, credit guarantee is done, development and promotional support is done. sectoral development financial literacy institutional development so these all these sectors amount will be given through mudra offerings which is through pradhan mantri mudra yojana and the scheme is called mudra loan is actually aiming at msme that is micro small and medium enterprises so in this respective loan system there are three different kinds of loan the first is called shishu second one is kishore and third one is tarun so there are three categories or ranges of amount given under this three categories shishu means up to 50000 amount is given where kishore means 50000 to 5 lakh and tarun means 5 lakh to 10 lakhs now the news is that rbi has expressed concern over rising bad loans from pradhan mantri mudra yojana okay while such a massive push have been lifted many beneficiaries out of poverty there has been some concerns at the growing level of npas or non performing assets emergence from this scheme so as a result of improved digital footprints msmes have become attractive clients for banks nbfcs that is non banking financial corporations and mfis thereby reducing their dependence on informal source of funds So according to the new press release of RBI RBI of RBI's deputy governor MK Jain on Tuesday raised red flags over rising NPA saying that loans disbursed under the government's mudra loan scheme and urged banks to monitor the repayment capacity of borrowers before disbursement application of technology was a main thing in this loan disbursement so same wise application of technology in finance has its own share of risk and challenges for regulators and supervisors early recognition of these risk and initiating actions to mitigate the regulated things and supervisory challenges is a key to harness the full potential of these developments similarly what we can also i is for the systemic risk may arise from unsustainable credit growth that is increased interconnectedness and financial risk manifested by lower profitability when data confidentiality and consumer protection is the other major areas that need to be addressed with respect to pradhan mantri mudra yojana and the mudra scheme basically what we can summarize in the discussion is that introduction of goods and services tax that is gst has helped in informal sector in a significant manner because by filing gst informal sector got a chance to move towards the formal sector and get the benefits from the government and even get a scheduled loans as a result of much improved digital footprint micro and small enterprises have become attractive clients for banks and nbfcs or non banking financial corporations and micro finance institutions thereby this reduces their dependence on the informal source of fund the cost of credit for the micro and small enterprises will also decrease meaningfully as lending will shift from collateral based lending to cash flow based lending that's all for today hope this helps thank you